Yamas to everyone tuning in. I have just premiered the fifth episode of the Athens Urbanist, my documentary series that takes a deep look into Athens and why it's such a vibrant city. So let me know where you're watching from and I am going to stick around to do a post Q&A of this episode. Let me know where we're watching from. Yamas. Right now we're listening to the song, one of the major songs that's featured on episode five, which is by a band a duo called Iamba. Uh, they are from Athens. Uh, two Athenians just making great, 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 great music. Uh, that is like electro pop which is uh, some of my favorite, personally. So welcome, everyone. Nice to see you here. Uh, this is a Q&A, so feel free to ask me literally anything about Athens and making a documentary series. I will uh, answer those two types of questions uh, because I'm happy to expound about the process of making this documentary series. For a little bit of background, this documentary series is six episodes long. They run between 30 minutes to 60 minutes long. Um, and it has been a labor of love. We filmed for two weeks in July of 2023. Uh, my videographer is Maria, uh, Maria Epida Querido, who is also the editor of this documentary series. And, um, and Katerina Kaku is our colorist, assistant editor, and illustrator. And the original score is made by Lefteris Vulanis, plus music that has been uh, lended to us by a whole host of awesome musicians. It's, all, it's a few of them. So it is uh, this one that you're listening to right now, Aemba, um, Edmis, Pampang, Pang, and Logout are the other musicians. All this, you can listen to it on the Urbanist, uh, of the official Athens Urbanist soundtrack, which is available on Spotify. Uh, if someone could put the link down below. Actually, I'm going to see if I can put the link myself. So welcome, everyone. Ariel, thank you so much for tuning in and giving me a, a super a few stars. I appreciate that. So feel free to ask me any questions about uh, the making of this documentary series. I want to expound uh, about the making of this documentary series, so feel free to ask me anything that you would like. And let me see, I'm gonna drop the link right here. All right, there we go. So now we have the soundtrack on the comments. There we go, and it's pinned. Perfect. Perfect, all right, awesome. Hey, Jacopo says, do you like Demi Russo? I'm not sure who that is. Let me know who that is. Hey, George says, I'm live for this. I'll watch the episode afterwards. Family business. Hey, George, I appreciate you watching the episodes in general. Thank you so much. Uh, Brown Eye Girl says, I just finished your watching your most recent video. I will watch the others. Are you planning to promote this to a bigger venue? Yeah, I, I now I have to figure that out. Um, <clears throat> the reason I made this documentary series is... One of the reasons that I made this documentary series is to make a TV show. Uh, to basically have a pilot that would work as a, as a bigger budget show um, funded, invested by a major streaming service. Or bought by a major, major streaming service like Netflix or Amazon or some big production company. Uh, that's my goal. I, I, I want to make something even bigger. Uh, I want to continue making the series in general. So I kind of, we're already going to do the Edinburgh Urbanist, which is coming out uh, probably around fall. It's going to take us a little bit longer um, because we're making a coffee documentary beforehand. But uh, after that, I want to continue going to other cities. I might be already filming in another Greek city 
this summer. Um, but it's, it's a lot of time and effort that goes to making the series. And I think a higher budget could add a lot to production value to give you even more epic experience. Um, so I'm working with what I have right now. The entire series was self-funded by me out of my pockets from the income I make from making videos on these social media platforms. Uh, but I want to be able to do something bigger. I think there's a lot of opportunity to have even better cinematography, uh, be faster with the editing, because editing is the thing that takes the longest, for sure. Uh, and then also to go to cities that are not as easy uh, and that would be f made easier by a larger budget. So luckily Athens was very easy to film in. I am confident I'll be easy, it'll be easy for me to film in another Greek city. It'll definitely be f easy for me to film it was easy for me to film in Edinburgh, but when it comes to maybe, say, France or Italy, where it's a different language, uh, there's a trickiness to it because I don't know the language. And it's easier to keep going to, to get things moving by knowing the language. So it'll be much easier if I have like a translator uh, or a fixer someone who was able to connect me with the locals. And then there's um, there's other places much farther away that I think would be interesting, like, like a part of Japan, like Hokkaido, Japan, or Vietnam, or a part of India uh, that I think could be a, make for a very great series, or, or Santiago, Chile, Buenos Aires, Argentina. There's a lot of opportunity to make really interesting series, or Mexico City as well. Hey, uh, Brown Eyed Girl says, are you open to sharing your documentaries to independent film companies? Yeah, 100%. I 100% uh, would deeply appreciate if someone shares my videos to a, to a, a, to, ooh, watch out. <laughs> uh, just trying to get a little bit comfortable. I 100% would love for someone to, to share this. So yeah, feel free to share this, uh, this work, this documentary series with anyone you think would be interested in seeing it. Uh, that includes um, production companies, if you know, or or um, really big culture institutions or or uh, media, or journalists. Feel free to share this with anyone. Mita says, I love your fashion always, looking sharp all the time. Thank you so much. I'm kind of in my home clothes. <laughs> But, but I'm glad. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so happy so many people are tuning in. Welcome, everyone. Nice to see you here. Uh, Gwen says, I really love rewatching your evolution all the time. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. That that means quite a lot, Gwen. I really appreciate that you've been tuning in for so long. So right now I'm drinking some Uzo. Cheers, everyone. Athena says, as a Greek living abroad, each episode is making me very emotional. I visited Klimataria last year with a group of international friends, and it was one of the most precious memories. Yeah, I already went to Klimataria twice. Episode 5 was the first time I went. I was so glad to be connected by Anthony Palamaris, who's also featured on episode 5. He connected me to Tu Nostodrio, and they invited me to Klimataria, and was so gracious to let me film and ask him questions and it was amazing and we got very lucky that we went on a day where there was like a wedding party uh a group of really happy tourists that i think were part of them were greek descendants and then uh and then just a large family that just loved partying we got lucky that we had that like trifecta of elements that really led to a, a really explosive night Justine says, I love your on-location movie tours. The Ghostbuster station is so cool. Thank you so much. Hey, Out and About says, sounds like you're looking for a challenge. Challenge yourself with traveling. 
Yeah, of course, but, um, I mean, I already do, I was about, but it's, 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 I think it's important to take the path of least resistance. I, um, I definitely step out of my comfort zone when it comes to doing a lot of stuff I do. But I have never been a believer in struggling of of grinding i think uh, that's why athens attracted me as a city it's a city that as a culture both as a city and nationally they don't believe in in kind of suffering for for work and i never been that way either so i am more than happy to go to places that are out of my comfort zone slightly, but I don't go too far on my comfort zone because I, 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 I believe that that is not quite necessary. Um, I think there's there's beauty in exploring with ease. And I think the reason that Athens came out so well is because there was a certain level of ease within me as the director and the host and then ease with my own videographer editor as well. And I think that ease translates also to our Edinburgh urbanists. It translated to the coffee documentary that I filmed and we still have yet to edit. And uh, I think it will translate to other bigger projects. Third time asking, says Joe. Hey, Joe, I appreciate you asking for multiple times. Thank you so much. Uh, how long was the editing process? So we filmed the first two weeks of July. Filming was done in two weeks. Each episode took about a month to edit. Uh, to even get started, yeah, I think we had the first episode pretty much locked in by August of 2023. And then there was an episode per month. But uh, we were a bit slower in the beginning of the year. I'm not exactly sure why. It was because episode 4 was quite intense. Episode 3 and 4 were quite intense because they were much longer than we anticipated. Originally, the plan was going to be make 7 episodes at 30 minutes each. But what ended up happening is that we realized we didn't have quite enough content or interesting topics for 7 episodes. So we decided to shorten it to six. However, the architecture bit, which is episode three, and number four, which was about the gentrification and the financial crisis, ended up being so interesting. And I got so inspired, and I wrote a lot of voiceover for it that the document that those episodes ended up being much longer, up to an hour long, and uh, that took us a while. So that those two episodes took us about two months to edit uh, and we're pretty quick uh, I think I think we could be quicker but that will require a higher budget you know because the reality of of a self-production is um, is I'm only limited by the money I have and um, and the amount that I was able to pay for my editor, my assistant editor, um, was not enough for them to say, this is the only thing I'm doing for a month. And that's understandable uh, because I would be in the same position. I would be in the same thought of mind if I were in their position. So that was a limitation. If if I have a bigger budget, then my editor and my assistant editor could just dedicate their entire month to this one project. So that that's the main challenge. Hey, Athena says, I, 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 see, I saw somewhere that your background was in tech. Uh, how did you make the shift to filmmaking? That is a very long story. I highly recommend searching my name, Ariel Vieira, on Spotify. I have a lot of podcasts where I actually go deep into that story. But I'll be brief right now. Um, I graduated from electrical engineering 2013. 
I decided to go into tech, not really using my engineering degree. I became a community manager in tech and I shifted to social media management uh, and started making videos for Vox Media. And after making those videos, I, I really got a taste for making videos. I loved it and I wanted to go on my own uh, due to some creative differences. Uh, basically, the, the company told me that they, they didn't want me to appear on camera anymore. Um, I, I understood the reasons why I did not take it too deeply personally, um, but I disagreed with them. So I ended up quitting and going my own way seven years ago. And I've been doing this for seven years, but I'm not new to social media because I was a Tumblr blogger, writer, for six years prior to this. So I've been in social media for 13 years at this point, more, 13 years, 13 years, close to seven. I've been doing social media for a long time. Joe says, wow, that's a lot of time. The quality is very high. That's better than fast, says Miss Love. Yeah, Miss Love, that's why I'm having a little bit of a change of heart with my coffee documentary and the Edinburgh Urbanist. The Edinburgh Urbanist, I was hoping to release it now. <laughs> like the Athens Urbanist, I thought was going to come out in fall. And I thought the Edinburgh Urbanist would be coming out now. And, and then I made a coffee documentary as well. But I've had a, a, a slight change of heart. I realized, yeah, time... It is worth putting the time into making a very good documentary. So we're gonna put that time for the coffee documentary and then we're gonna put that time for the Edinburgh Urbanist. So uh, they'll, they'll, they'll come out a little bit later than expected, but I think it'll be worth it. I miss when Vice used to do food and travel documentaries. Ariel would have been a great fit for that channel. Jer, I actually applied to Vice. I applied to Vice after, after quitting my nine to five. And I applied to a role of producer editor. And, um, and as I was, um, as I was going to this job interview and their beautiful offices in Williamsburg, I was one out of 10 other candidates there of all varying ages. And first that got me dismayed because I thought to myself, okay, I'm just like another cog in the machine. And then the, then I went to the interview and the person didn't read my resume. They didn't read my experience. They didn't read my cover letter. They, the person who was interviewing me, who was one of the producers, seemed to have no clue who I was. They didn't even care who I was. Uh, so they just asked me some very generic interview questions. And I seemed to have impressed them a little bit. And uh, they told me what the nature of the job was. And once uh, they told me the nature of the job, for producer editor, they said, oh, no, this is not a full-time position. This is a permalance position. Permalance is lingo for we want to hire you full-time without paying you full-time. So permalance basically means you're a freelancer for 40 hours a week. <laughs> Quite literally, that, that was the thing uh, about seven, eight years ago in the media world and in the tech world. Uh, so I was going to work full time for them and not give, not be given any benefits, no dental, no health benefits. And I would be paid less and I would have to do my own taxes as well. So I would have zero, zero, uh, benefits. And when I heard that, I was shocked. And then I look around the office and I see everyone so hectic and anxious and kind of shuffling around. The entire atmosphere of Vice was not what I imagined. It was not what I saw personally like three years prior when I was invited by a friend to visit. It changed. And it seemed to me like an environment that was more 
keen on making profits than making good media. And I realized, no, no, I, 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 I told the person, no, I'm not interested there on the spot. And I, I think uh, they quite did not uh, expect me to say that. Uh, even before, like they didn't, ha they didn't offer me anything. I'd said to no to them, go or, like finishing the interview. And uh, at that moment, I knew that Vice, along with many other media companies, wouldn't last for long. And I really loved Vice, and I really loved the other media companies I applied for. I applied for BuzzFeed. I worked for Vox. Uh, I worked for Gawker. Uh, I applied to Atlas Obscura, and all these media companies have gone, have gone downhill. And the reason I even quit, quit the media industry was because I knew deep down inside that I wanted to make media that brings people joy, that makes people feel wonder. And the fact is the current media industry or the media industry that was the case eight years ago, but still is the case, is so fixated on making profits because these media companies accept a lot of investment and these investors, these stakeholders expect 10x returns. So if you're making a million dollars in profit in 2023, these investors in in expect you to make $10 million in profit in 2024 in exchange for their investment. And this is natural. I understand this works for industry, for heavy industry, or for, for tech hardware, uh, or for like an operating system, something that could be 10 x But doesn't work for media. I don't think so. Because the, the danger is if media becomes a profit forward focused industry you lose on a proper journalism b good entertainment and c you lose out on the aspect of feeling good because the easiest way to make money from media is to make people feel anxious and worried you get fear and anxiousness into people they click more they read more, they watch more because they because those two feelings are the ones that are easier to monetize online due to the nature of online and due to human nature. So to instill joy and wonder into others is not as profitable in the short term. But I think I'm fairly confident it is profitable in the long term uh, because this is very evident with uh, movies, you know, like Disney movies or Star Wars or Marvel properties um, or some of the more better documentaries out there, like National Geographic as a, as a magazine as well. Um, these, these properties instill joy in others. And uh, some of them took a while to become massively profitable. Some of them were heavily profitable in the beginning, but then continued to be profitable for decades. So my belief is that media that brings joy to others is more profitable in the long term. And I don't care about short-term profits. I care about making people feel good. And that's why I couldn't work in the media industry. And uh, I'm glad that people are saying that this documentary series feels like what you, Vice used to be. Because I think Vice had its heart in the right place in the beginning. Um, and many other platforms did. But they lost their way due to the need for profits. And of course, we all need to make some profit. But uh, it's better not to get too lost in it. Uh, well, from what you're saying now, it's like you went out of your comfort zone to do what you're doing. No nine to five. <laughs> Pythagorean. Yeah, 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 exactly. You know, uh, it's all, it's all about your point of reference when it comes to discussing these, um, these stories, you know, to me, this is not too much out of my comfort zone. 
Uh, but to someone else, yeah, of course. Hey, touring different places. All right, let's go back to the documentary series. Susie says, what company does your taxes? I'm referring to... If you get paid a full-time wage, you get a W-2, and hence the company withholds your taxes immediately. And generally, as an employee, you end up getting tax returns. Uh, that is not the case as a freelancer. A freelancer, you get paid as a W-9, and you have to withhold your own taxes. And generally, you'll be taxed more because you're a self-employee. Yes. So... Uh, in, in short, not to get too deep into taxes, um, if you're freelance or so-called permalance, you pay more in taxes than you do as a full-time employee. Um, what forms of media have you sold out, of, out to this fear tactic? I personally have not been involved in making said media uh, because I was... I... I I did not actually write or make videos. I did not actually write for my first media company, Gawker. And for my second media company, it was uh, architecture and and design uh, media. So it wasn't too fear-based, but I saw it in general in the media world. Jer, Jer asks, and any times you were filming something and didn't like the food? So, in general, yes. But uh, in terms of the Athens Urbanist. I don't think we encountered a place with bad food the entire time we were filming. We definitely filmed more food but we didn't include everything and almost all the times we had interviews we were eating something but we didn't include everything so um no i didn't encounter bad food in the filming of the athens urbanist if i do encounter bad food if it's recorded i just won't publish the video or include it in the edit this happened to this this happens to be in a coffee documentary. There was one coffee shop where I was really disappointed in. So I might not include them in the coffee documentary. But um, if it's live, it's hard to hide. But there's very few instances where I really hated the food. When I did hate the food, you, you, you definitely saw it. I basically express how much I dislike it if it was really egregiously bad. And then um, I tend to unlist the video. You should apply to work for the Travel Channel. Uh, they'll have you traveling all around the world. I mean, I wouldn't work with them as a full-time employee, but I would be happy to host a show for them. Uh, they're different. So um, in the media industry, if you're hired as a host, you're you're hired for that series. You're not technically working for the Travel Channel. Uh, Travel Channel is paying a production company, and that production company pays you. Or if you're a producer as well, then then the Travel Channel ends up paying you. But uh, but yes, I'll be happy to host the show. I would love to work for TV. I think TV is dying for sure, but I think there's still value in TV. I a lot of my live video viewers tend to skew a bit older, just like TV is now today. And I've seen the value and the joy of making content for an audience that skews older. Uh, so, so I would love to make TV, yeah, for that reason. What questions did passerbyers ask you while shooting the Athens Urbanist? In Greece, generally people kind of mind their own business. Um, in Greek culture, people might talk about you <laughs> because there's this genuine curiosity about someone, a stranger. Uh, someone that they don't know. There's a genuine curiosity. But uh, people who gen genuine generally don't um, didn't kind of bother us while we were filming. Um, only a few times people did ask us, hey, where are you filming? And that was just the very general question. 
And yeah, we told them that we're making a documentary series. So we really didn't get that many questions beyond that. Any recommendations to go to uh, uh, any recommendations to go to spring in the city? Says John. John, ask me anything about Athens. Uh, Athens Urbanist, the documentary series. I'll be brief in New York. Uh, go to Bryant Park. Go to the Bronx Zoo. Irene says, you've given us seven to eight years of joy. Hey, I'm so glad. Can you talk about a specific scene that was challenging or rewarding to shoot in the latest video? Any particular moment that encapsulates uh, the experience of making this documentary? Says Brown Eyed Girl. Yeah, yeah, you know, that's a great question. I certainly love directing, but I am not the best person to formulate good looking shots on film. That is not my strong suit. I know how to make a good shot that moves. I can tell you, I am really good at directing movement, I think. Uh, that's why I gravitated to making dance short films a few years ago. That's why I love live video. That's why I love the short videos. And you notice my short videos, um, despite uh, the few complaints I get, um, I love moving around the camera. It's my favorite thing. Uh, but I'm not so good at kind of like having the camera still and like kind of getting that perfect frame. I've never been that quite type of person. Uh, and I just have a like a tough time even kind of formulating something. So that was my biggest challenge, especially in the scene of the taverna. It was challenging to make the shots look really beautiful due to the lighting conditions. Also the beer scene, uh, the, that beer bar, that tap room was, uh, had this type of lighting, this type of fluorescent lighting that made a banding on the video so you see this kind of banding on the video and unfortunately that's very hard to work in those conditions especially spontaneously um so i w i wish i could make those scenes look better i'm sh like anthony bourdain was able to shoot some great nightlife scenes in his documentary series and it's because of that higher production like if you get a cinematographer because Maria is a great videographer. She's very fun to film with. Um, but she's not a cinematographer. Cinematographer comes also with a different set of skills. A uh, cinematographer is someone who knows lighting and um, knows um, different camera angles and knows how to um, frame a shot uh, with the lighting and with the color that you see on location. All these elements, you know... Um, and I think with a higher budget, I would love to have a, a cinematographer, a director of photography, for sure. Um, but the good thing of having a videographer like Maria is that there, she is really spontaneous. She was able to, uh, get up and go and film everything and anything and um, film these long conversations and really get into the conversations, film while we were walking and exploring and that type of being light, light footed when it comes to filming is a big, big bonus. And that's why I loved working with her. Uh, but definitely a bigger budget, uh, having a director of photography could really, really change things. Kotsa says, hey, my friend from Paris. Today, the city's celebrating the Olympiacos football team in the semifinals in Europe. Hey, good luck on that. And Johnny says, hey, I've been following you for a while, but not all of your traveling. I like it when you're back home. I do understand your love for traveling. Uh, it's blessed to do what you love. 
Hey, yeah. I'm glad people love my New York City content. Um, there is a New York City documentary coming out about coffee. So stay tuned about that. Um, and yeah, I will. I aim on doing more live videos of New York locations in May. So stay tuned for that. Purple says, I love listening to you. I love the, the, what that beer, I love when the beer guide offered your camera or us a drink. Yeah, he he offered technically Maria a drink <laughs> because she was behind the camera. And Maria has this great ability of, of, um, of filming from a pers first person perspective. And this is what I really look forward for in a videographer is someone who can film in a, in a way that emulates how someone would be there on location. That can film the way someone would look at a scene, look at a person, move through a space. You know, that's why I it can't work with videographers that play it too safe. That are too static. That are too... Um, that don't have that much empathy for others. I think that's a very key for a great video videographer, someone who has empathy, who can who can uh, be in the space um, and and not just be a invisible, but kind of just be a be there, you know. And I think it translates to to the audience. The audience feels like they're there, and I think that's very important for me as a filmmaker. How long have you been working with Maria? We started working together in 2022, summer of 2022. She edited, the first video she edited was my short videos about the Netherlands. Miss Lobb says that feeling you get is that is that you're right there. The dancing scenes, dancing scenes feel like that. Yes. And Ms. Lop, thank you so much for the word. A participant. Yes, that's is very key. I don't want uh, a fly in the wall, necessarily. I want a participant uh, when it comes to videography. So, yes. That, to me, that's key. Is someone who's there participating in the event. Will you be able to have a live... Will you be able to have a live with both your videographer and yourself? And your editor and the three of us can do a question and answer. Yeah, I we really wanted to do that for the Athens Urbanist. Is that uh, Maria is based in Greece. Her assistant videographer is also based in Greece. Uh, but when I'm back in Greece, yes, I will drag him in front of the camera. Because I think it will be worth it. Thank you for your amazing holistic uh, videos from Athens says Scott Saul, also philosophical videos. Thank you for your general perspective. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, the reason why Anthony Bourdain was so good is because he went beyond the food and beyond the, the general topic was philo uh, politics in his latter, um, in his last series. But he went beyond just talking about the sheer, um, sheer food and politics he was more he was more poetic about it uh he had his own voice with his poetry for sure he had this kind of noir style to his manner of writing and speaking uh which i really appreciate i i am not that type of person i am not that kind of i don't have that kind of dark at least not in the same sense of his that kind of dark humor um i i'm not as pessimistic as that they bourdain is uh or I, I don't have this kind of fascination with the darker parts of humanity as Anthony bourdain did but i do see the value in the poetry and i've been a writer longer than i've been a filmmaker so in the voiceover for this documentary series and also in the interviews, I decided to go a little bit beyond the plain subject matter, 
which is architecture, music, food, history. Uh, go beyond it and ask questions that are deeper and write something in the voiceover especially that feels like it's more personal and more kind of not not personal in like in a context of like me but like on a human level like what is experiencing a city like Athens and that's why I make a lot of comparison personally I personally love comparison uh, I love tying connections between different cities and trying to tell a holistic tale about a city because I think a, the downside of many documentaries and documentary series about travel specifically is that either they're too practical and I do appreciate like someone like Rick Steves who's kind of straightforward and tells you the the practical things about the city and the basic history and the basic culture. But I think the trap is to only focus on the city itself and to think that comparing a city like Athens to New York or to Paris is a distraction or a tangent. I think not. I think by comparing and by offering a a alternate, uh, by offering a juxtapose, juxtaposing histories together, I think you really get a sense of more than just the city. You get a sense of how cities work, not just a city works, not just how Athens works, but just how cities work how history functions and, and um i think that's important i think it's important to see the patterns throughout different cities because if you start seeing the patterns throughout different cities and different histories all uh juxtaposed together you end up realizing that a lot of places share the same stories and the same type of rhythm of stories and um And a lot of people are afraid of comparing historical and cultural differences because they think it's a bad thing. And I say this in the documentary. But by comparing, you end up realizing that we are closer. That you are not alone. That your city is not alone. That your political situation is not alone. Alone. That your faults, that your struggles are not alone. That your triumphs are not alone. You end up realizing that you are not alone. That you are part of this larger global community of human nature. And that our problems sometimes feel like they are only us. That our struggles with life only affects us because they feel so big from our personal perspective. But when you zoom out, I end up real realizing personally that it isn't so bad. At least some things. It isn't so bad. We all go through frustrations of the slow metro system in whatever city we're at. Uh, we all struggle with property values. We struggle with political turmoil. But you're not alone. And I think sometimes it's also a kind of a slap to the face that we need because we get too caught up with our turmoils thinking that we are the only ones suffering and struggling, that we are the only ones that, uh, oh, poor me. Some people, some people, not everyone, but some people act like this. 
Oh, it's poor me, poor me. Sometimes you need a slap in the face and realize, no, no. <laughs> you're not the only one. You're not the only community. You're not the only city. You're not the only country. You're not the only one. Uh, this affects a lot of people. Uh, and you're not the only one. So um, it's, it's good to gain perspective outside of just one topic. And that's why my voiceover in this documentary series, my narration... Um, I think goes a bit beyond. And I hope it goes beyond it in the way that it makes you feel good, ultimately. Uh, because I don't want you to feel pessimistic about the world. I want you to ultimately feel optimistic about the world. Hey, Daryl, thank you so much for tuning in. Hope you're doing well, Daryl. Hope you're okay. Hope you're hold holding in there. Do you see or feel some similarities uh, between Athenians and Latin Americans, like the Cuban people? Because after watching your videos, I felt this. Yes, I mean, um, I am not too close with Cubans, so I don't know too much about Cubans. I never really ever been close to Cubans because I grew up in New York City. And I have rarely encountered kind of Cuban culture aside from the Cubans that immigrated to Puerto Rico generations ago. So I do have family that comes from Cuba. Uh, but I've seen a lot of similarities with Puerto Ricans, for sure. For sure. Athens, to me, really reflects a lot of Puerto Rico. And I'm sure it reflects a lot of Cuba, too. There's, of course, there are differences, but there's a lot of similarities. Purple says, Are you upset? You look sad. No, I'm I'm not sad. <laughs> I'm just uh having a good and vulnerable conversation. Patrick says, you have your own style, you do your things your own way. We all enjoy your content. I'm so glad. Uh but purple, no, no, I'm not sad. Far from it, luckily. I think um I think uh, making this series about Athens made me realize the turmoil that many people experience. Because episode three, specifically, I go into the episode with this thesis, basically saying, hey, these buildings, the Polakatekia, the apartment buildings of Athens, that are also all around Greece, not just Athens, to many people, they look ugly. To many locals, I met many Athenians, and they told me this, that it's ugly. To me, initially, when going first going to Greece, I thought it was ugly. And I've come to really fall in love with this style of architecture. And um, I realized by expressing this love for this style of architecture, it triggers a lot of people. Because it's like, how dare you find beauty in something that makes me suffer so much? And I have no easy answer. No easy response to that. Because it's true all around the world. New York is gorgeous. But some people... Just deep down inside, of course, uh, there's different circumstances, there's different life, there's different moments in life that, to others, New York is, is a place of suffering. But to me, you know, New York has been a, a place of beauty and wonder and serendipity. And the same thing has happened to me in Athens and many other cities. And it's, it's, it's tough expressing that joy and that wonder about a place because especially in the public level people will uh, people have accused me of being heavily romantic of being idealistic of of being disingenuous as well of all these things um and i understand why someone would say that but I disagree. <laughs> I think Athens is beautiful. 
So uh, that's why um, that's why it's really mind opening doing doing this type of look into a culture of a place. I agree with the concept of similarities with Latin Americans. Knowing that the Indians do much, uh, do much closer now. They do blend well with us. Yes, yes. There's a lot of similarities. Hyde says Vice Media worth once worth 5.7 billion has filed for bankruptcy. Yep, yep, they have. Was there a scene that was cut from the final version of this recent video that you wish you would have kept? Brown Eyed Girl, great question. No, no, uh, we removed a lot on purpose. The only one regret I have with episode five is that I did not include the beautiful music of Anthony Palamaris, who's the pianist I featured in the second interview of this episode. We didn't have the time to ask him to make a, a piano piece. Uh, so, and he doesn't have much recorded music because he's a piano player mostly for other musicians. So, uh, I, yeah, uh, it just didn't work out. I didn't, we didn't quite have the ability to get a piano piece from him. And I regret not asking one of uh, a piano piece from him earlier so we could have featured it. What do you learn about this uh, uh, around in Greece than before? A lot. I mean, uh, all my learnings are basically on the episodes. Uh, DS, thank you so much for tuning in. All, all my learnings are on the episodes. Uh, about the architectural history. I didn't realize that the architecture was built without the use of too much monetary exchange. It was mostly without the use of banks, without the use of loans. A lot of construction was uh, accomplished. I learned about the Greek Civil War. I don't talk about the Greek Civil War too much, actually. So there was more about the Greek Civil War that I was going to include, but did not include it. Uh, and the and the uh, takeover of the three generals, the three colonels, uh, the military junta. I did not cover that much more in depth. I, I definitely had more to cover. Let's see what other questions we have. What are three things you love most about Athens and two things you're not so hot about? Culture, number one, I love how Athenians are so easygoing. And this translates into eating out, drinking, partying, uh, going to shops. It translates to all aspects of life in Athens and Greece in, as a whole. It's very easygoing culture, easygoing culture. Um, the second thing is people are so, always so curious about where you're from or why you're or why you're in Greece, and I really love that. I really love that genuine curiosity. That seems to be on a very cultural level because you don't get that everywhere. Italy, no one gives a shit where you're coming from. <laughs> Sometimes they do, but not too much. France, even less. They don't give a shit where you're from. <laughs> They're like, uh, they don't give a shit why you're here. <laughs> They only care about why you're speaking French the wrong way. Uh, the French are awesome for other reasons, but that, that is not one of their strong suits, is, is having a genuine curiosity about you. Uh, but Greeks are. And I think the third thing is, to me, the architecture, it, uh, the, the cities themselves and the towns, there's a lot of mixed use. So there's businesses and there's homes above. All this mixed use makes the cities, no matter how small the village or how big the city like Athens or a, or a second bigger city like Thessaloniki, feel vibrant. There's a lot of life in the streets, which is not the case with every city. Not the case with every city that is, is as big. The things I don't like about Greek culture or Athens... It is not as clean as other cities. Um, yeah, not as clean as other cities. I 
I, you know, I am hard pressed to find too many things I dislike because I really love Athens and Greece. I wish it was less car dependent, for sure. I wish it were easy to transport around. But when it comes to Greek culture, you know, I, I really love a lot of it. I can see that there's some big issues in Greek culture, for sure. Uh, but I love a lot of it. Yeah. Brown Eyed Girl says, uh, how did you approach the end credits, including any special acknowledgements or post credit sequences? So the post credit scenes are very similar to Netflix or to HBO. I wanted to tease what happens in the next episode. Uh, this is the case for episode one through four. Episode five, I don't add a teaser because I ended the question, uh, ended the episode in a very kind of pertinent question, which will be answered in the sixth and final episode. Um, the, yeah, and then the post credit sequence, stay tuned. Episode six has a post credit sequence for a teaser for something else. Uh, but beyond that, yeah, uh, that's the only, it's, it's for practical reasons, for, for storytelling reasons. I want to tease you so you watch the next episode. But I don't want to make it in a way where you feel like you need to watch. Like, I, I don't want to tell you stay tuned for next episode. Well, I do say that. I don't want to make it seem like you necessarily have to watch the next episode. If you get what I, I'm trying to get at, it's a bit hard to explain convey but um i want each episode to feel like it's its own thing but at the same time to make you aware that's a part of a series and if you want to learn more about this topic stay tuned to the next episode so the first five episodes almost all of them end with a question and then i go into the credits and i uh, and i do a small post credit sequence to emphasize, hey, there's more to learn. Uh, stay tuned for this next episode. So it is a cliffhanger. But the cliffhanger is not so... Narratively big as like a Netflix series. Uh, like at the end of it, I think you'd still feel like you've finished watching... A full story. That's 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 the number one thing. I want you to feel like you finished watching a full story in the episode. But to let you know that there's more. To learn about a different aspect of Athens. Uh, that was my intention. Uh, as for the post-credits kind of illustration. That was the brainchild of our illustrator, assistant editor, Katerina. So a round of hearts to Katerina. And she came up with this amazing post-credits screen. I told her, hey, can you make the credits look a little bit better? And she came up with this post-credits uh, animation. It's gorgeous. I love it. And that's why we have that. And then special acknowledgments. We basically acknowledge anyone who's appeared on the episode. There's not that many special acknowledgments. Uh, would you live in Greece and Athens? Yes, I would. Uh, Purple says, okay, I won't watch the next episode. <laughs> no, no, stay tuned. Uh, would Athens be a city you can see yourself moving to someday? Yes. Are there a lot of street murals in Athens? Yes. There is. Pay attention to the to the series. Uh, we do show quite a lot of street murals. The two, graffiti, the two street artists we interviewed in episode four are street muralists. They, they're not taggers. They're street muralists. So, uh, and we did show their work in the in the episode. So, yeah, pay attention. It's just, it's just that the style of street art looks very graffiti-like, uh, a good portion of it. But there is, there is kind of more traditional murals out there, for sure.
All right, let me scroll back to see. Kat says, what's the idea behind the purple lighting? Just because I like purple. Uh, and one of the songs we featured is called Purple, like this one. It's called Purple by Iamba. That's why. Also, I think it looks cool. The Vertica, another different type of music and philosophy. I covered that in episode five, yeah. Check it out. Let's see. Victoria says, it's fascinating. Millie left a $5 super chat. Hey, Millie, thank you so much. I'm so sorry I did not acknowledge it earlier. I've been so impressed by your knowledge of the Athens documentary. Imagine it with your ideal budget. You know, I, I would I, I would not redo Athens at all. Uh, but would I love to do another part of Greece with a bigger budget? For sure. 100%. Uh, so thank you so much for your super chat. But yes, uh, I would love, 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 love to do like Cyprus or the Greek islands with a bigger budget. It would be a dream. What about London? London. Yeah. Let me know if you want to hear my thoughts about London. <laughs> London went from one of my favorite cities to not so much anymore. Um, is there anything you ate that you absolutely loved? I loved Greek salad. Like, I am not a big salad eater at all. For most of my life, I did not like salad. I started getting into salad because of Sweet Green here in New York City, which is a salad chain. I actually covered them on a live video a long time ago. But I really don't like salad. Like, I've never been such a big fan. But Greek salad is just on another level. It is the, the best thing in the world, truly. Brother girl says, um, but the the one the one specific dish I had that was very unique in Greece. It's not featured in the documentary series, but it is featured in one of my live videos. Is um, a, a, a dish called cheesecake dacos from a restaurant called Kuki in Kukaki in in Athens, and this cheesecake dacos is. Is uh is basically dacos, which is a the Cretan Greek salad, the Cretan salad, uh, which has tomatoes, but also like mashed tomatoes, uh, feta cheese, and this kind of hardened bread. And what they did is uh, crushed the hardened bread and made it into like a graham cracker crust, and then put the 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 mashed tomatoes. And the feta cheese on top and drizzled it with olive oil. And oh my god. Oh my god. Some of the best food in the world. What brand of olive oil do you use in the United States? I need to find that Greek olive oil. I can't. I haven't found it. I, I gotta I gotta go to one of these Greek neighborhoods and uh, find some Greek Greek like real Greek olive oil because the olive oil that they have in American supermarkets is second grade or low grade olive oil. And this is very true. If you buy Italian or Greek olive oil at a major supermarket, it will be the leftover olive oil from those countries, which they deemed as poor quality and they sell it to the US and to the UK. And this is very well documented. There's a lot of documentaries about it on YouTube. Uh, and this sucks. So people are asking me about London, so I'll be brief, but I am a huge fan of British culture, of English culture, and I am a very big fan of Britishness, of British food, of British history, 
of British culture. I'm a huge fan of a lot of things British, and I really do appreciate it. And I think Britain has been a powerful force in the world that has done a lot of great things. Of course, history is complicated, and he, every country is complicated. So uh, there's also some bad things that were involved in in Britain as a as an entity throughout history. But um, I am very sad to see that Britishness has disappeared from London. You don't really get a sense. I, I went this past year and it really hit me. It was like, I don't feel like I'm in England. I feel like I'm in another country. And I, I'm all for multiculturalism when I think in New York, we do it right. Because in New York, we have a New York culture that is due to its multiculturalness. But I think in, in London, somehow they've erased this Englishness rather than mix it or embrace it or stir it up with other cultures. I think other cultures have unfortunately replaced uh, Englishness in London. And so much so that me going to London, I just don't feel like I'm in England. Uh, and it, it's a bit sad to me uh, because, you know, as a as a New Yorker, I love that I'm in New York and I still feel like I'm in New York. Or I go to Paris and Paris still kind of maintains that Parisianness, uh, for sure. Rome, you know, maintains that Italianness, that Romanness. But London, not so much. And there's a few other cities out there in the world that are, are becoming the same. And it, it's a bit sad to see uh, a city that has been so open, so much to the point that has allowed its own culture to be erased and i hope i hope it doesn't go further because i would love i would love uh london to embrace and to continue to showcase its long proud history and also its food and and cultural elements like beer and gin and uh and the British flag, and there's a lot of other aspects about um, English culture that I think are very interesting. Can you uh, discuss any unique filming techniques? Uh, unconventional filming techniques used in a particular video. Yeah, episode five is, is very easy. It's the... So one of one of the more interesting filmmakers out there, his name is Wong Kar Wai, and he's famous for movies Chungking Express, In the Mood for Love, and he's made a few other movies. But In the Mood for Love and Chungking Express are two great films, especially In the Mood for Love. Great, great film. One of the best films ever made. And one thing he incorporates in his filmmaking is that he lowers down the frame rate a lot and has this kind of jagged uh, feel uh, look to it. And he does that on purpose uh, because in, in his movies, he wants to convey kind of this kind of um, distortion of, of time, this kind of sense of, of feeling lost and feeling uh, confused by a... a something happening and it's happening so fast that it feels blurry i think that i think that's his intention in essence in his movies uh and you can easily tell that anthony bourdain was a huge fan of world car y uh, and and their producers as well but you can tell that anthony bourdain himself was a fan of world car y because they he used this technique a lot in this show of slowing down the frame rate and having this jaggedness I um I love it uh, and I, I I won't use it as much as Anthony Bourdain uh, but uh, in episode five I think it was very appropriate with where we were drinking with Marcos so uh, me and Maria 
um, decided to lower down the frame rate in certain scenes where we're hanging out with Marcos as we're drinking to give that effect of one car wide. So that was a unique way of filmmaking. The other, the other things that we did were the, the walk and talk, uh, the, what I call the friend shot. The friend shot, I think I'm pretty much the only filmmaker that really does it. I, I bet there's other films that have done it, but I can't find too many examples. And the friend shot is very simple. It's basically the camera person is walking besides me, not in front of me. Like you see in many hosted TV programs where the 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 host is walking towards the camera and the camera person is, is walking backwards. So it's very authoritative, that kind of stance. It's it's like I am the host, I am the 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 master of this broadcast. I am going to take you on this journey because I'm going to teach you. I am the teacher. That's kind of the, the sense that you get with that type of shot. And this is seen in every TV program, uh, basically, with the exception of Anthony Bourdain. He didn't really do this. But you see this in Rick Steves. You see this in Samantha Brown. You see this in jo uh, Josh Gates's programs. And um, I don't like that. Because I don't, I don't necessarily want you to feel like I am the the master of the show the the host per se i want you more so to feel like you're a friend coming along the journey with me so rather than doing that shot uh i rather have the camera person the videographer walk alongside me and walk with me in the same direction and i'm looking at the camera like if i were speaking to a friend like so now we're going to Keramikos, and in Keramikos, we're going to go to this awesome restaurant. It was right over there. And then the camera pans and goes, look over there. I like that. Uh, and this is very subtle. Uh, I think now that I've explained it, you probably end up really seeing it uh, now all the time. You'll, you'll, you'll end up beco becoming very conscious of it. But the, the reason I do that is in order to give this sense of a that you are a equal to me i am not a uh, above you i am not your teacher i am not your professor i am your friend who's taking you on the journey for fun but you're a part of this journey and that is my intention when filming this documentary series and with all my documentaries uh, that is my intention. I want you to feel like you're there with me. Um, most documentaries, that is not top of mind. They don't want you to feel like you're there with them. Most documentaries want to offer an authoritative voice or be a fly on the wall. So, especially on TV, when it comes to Discovery, Netflix, the major big, big, big documentary series... They want to be authoritative. I'm here telling you a story. Like a lecture. Like a professor. Like a tour guide. I'm here telling you a story. Artsy documentaries, the ones that tend to win the awards at the Oscars. Uh, the ones that are in movie theaters. They tend to be fly on the wall. I'm not here. You're just seeing the scene play out. Shh, I'm not here. Don't look at me. That is, that is the other type of documentary filmmaking. I can see the value in both of them, for sure. Uh, I, I tend to prefer more the authoritative ones because you know I'd rather someone tell me what's happening than. Just kind of trying to figure it out because the camera's pointing at a kitchen for four for 30 minutes <laughs> but those are the two types of uh two types of documentaries it's very rare to find a documentary that you feel like you're there with the person with the host and with the camera person the camera person in essence i want the camera person the camera and in turn the camera person 
to be a surrogate for the audience. So I want you to feel like you're there with me. Like we're in this adventure together. And that you have agency in this adventure. Ultimately, in live video you do. As an audience, you do have agency in the, in the adventure. Because you as the audience right now are asking me questions. And if I were doing one of my regular walking videos, exploration videos, you would say, hey, uh, I, uh, can we have coffee? Can we try that coffee shop? Ooh, that coffee shop looks good. And I go there and have the coffee shop. And you ask me about the coffee. You ask me about that pastry. You ask me about that landmark. You ask me, let's go into that landmark. That, in a live video, that comes very natural. You have that agency. On a documentary, ultimately, you won't have that agency. Ultimately. But I can make you feel like you do. By learning the techniques that I've learned on live video. And hence, when I ask a question, uh, I do this a lot in my, in my writing for my voiceover. And I do this on spoken on camera as well. But on voiceover especially, I am very cognizant that when I'm writing the voiceover, I am writing it in a conversational way and I'm asking questions. And the reason I do that is because I want you to feel like you're conversing there with me. So that makes you feel like you have agency in the adventure. And hence, that's why I think I've gotten comments like this. And let me know right now in the comments. Uh, but in the past five episodes, I've gotten comments of people saying, I feel like I'm there with you. Oh, I, feel, I felt so immersed. I felt like I was having dinner with you. I, I, uh, I lost myself in this episode. I got, I got a lot of comments like that. And I think the reason I got a lot of those comments was because of this approach. And that has always been, from day one, from starting Urbanist, that has been my intended approach. And I aim to do this in bigger documentaries. I think, uh, I think there's way more ways to increase this immersion in filmmaking techniques. And I try, I, because I've spoken to a few people who are involved in the film business, and they all have been the wonderful people, and we've had awesome conversations, but when I try to convey this in words, they just don't get it. Or they don't think it's that important. But, I know it is. Because I know that Anthony Bourdain to the studio, to the TV station, Travel Channel, when he first started in the Food Network, didn't think it was so important to bring techniques from great films into a show about food and travel. But he did. And it ended up becoming one of the greatest types of documentary filmmaking there has ever existed so far um, and I know that you can immerse people beyond what has been done so far in documentaries there is a way to make people feel like you're there with you and uh, that is my main intention so I hope, I hope that ends up being the case. And that's why I made this documentary series. Is the, the other reason I made this documentary. There's a lot of reasons I made this documentary series. But another reason I did it was because I knew I could do it. I knew I could do this. I knew I could make you feel immersed. And that's what I set out to do. Excuse me. Excuse me. And I hope I accomplished that. Hey, Glenny says, definitely, Ariel, your approach uh, makes the viewer feel like you are their friend, makes them want to join the dialogue. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's why in part I got a lot of like really big 
in-depth comments from people. Uh, it wasn't just the subject matter because there's other YouTubers who cover architecture and cover the implications on people's lives with architecture. But not every YouTube video about architecture or about food gets that long comments from people. And I think the reason it got those long comments is because of that immersion. It's because people felt like, oh, they need to share their own perspective. And that's a good thing. How much travel has changed you and brightened your horizons? A lot, BC. A lot. A lot. Um, I think... Um, Ultimately, the biggest thing about travel has been looking at home and my own culture and my own city and my own uh, heritage, which is Puerto Rico. Looking at it with fresh eyes and looking at it with a deeper appreciation. Because I think part of the desire deep down inside to travel is to escape, is to see something new, is novelty, is to do something new, to meet someone new, to see something new. And then deeper than that, deeper than that feeling, is this kind of jadedness, this kind of apathy towards your own place, your town, your village, your, your city, your neighborhood, your country, your culture. And I think a lot of people will say, no, no, that's not the case. They'll, they'll, they'll deny that. But I think it's true. I think deep down inside, if you go deeper, deeper, if you go beyond that desire for novelty or to escape or to experience something interesting, if you go beyond that, if you go deeper than that and really anchor down into yourself and dig into those deep feelings of why you want to travel, why do you travel? And this is uh, the case with content creators who make travel content, who are on the endless pursuits of more interesting things to cover or to someone just going for a short vacation but if you go deeper you'll you'll find those negative feelings especially if you've been so fixated on traveling uh you'll you'll find those feelings it's this kind of sense of like oh i don't like where i'm at i don't like this place feel like there's something better somewhere but when you travel you end up realizing what you have where you're from who you're with it's pretty damn special too and and i've gotten to the point where i've been very lucky to travel even more uh and by traveling to even more places. I've traveled only really through North America and Europe, but I've traveled a lot within these two continents. I end up realizing we're all the same. We all have the same struggles, the same issues, the same worries, the same hardships, the same good things, the same fun things, the same vices the same virtues there's a lot more similarities between us and that through traveling by seeing that sameness that same pattern repeated over and over again it makes me feel not alone it makes me feel um not resentful for things that are out of my control. 
Because it's very easy to take things to be very resenting if you're stuck in the place. And this is definitely a, a fact with, with um, not everyone has the ability to travel, for sure. Um, so you can easily be stuck in the place and and just feel like you're the only one suffering. You're the only one going through this. And and uh, it's so terrible. And, and why you? And why this? And why me? And why, 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 why? And then when you get to traveling, you end up realizing <laughs> this thing that I'm complaining about, this thing I'm feeling bad about, um, it's kind of out there. Everyone goes through this. Uh, so maybe it's not so bad. And yeah, yeah, that's why I've learned uh, mostly about traveling. I think that's why I love uh, making live videos is uh, I love for, I know not everyone's able to travel for sure. Uh, not everyone's able to walk around the city for a few hours. And um, I really love making these live videos because it, it is a at least a, a way to travel uh, when you're unable to do so otherwise. <laughs> Patrick says, notice how Ariel takes a moment uh, for these questions to give us well thought out and honest answers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, one can get into the trap of just speaking and uh, and not really letting something process. One thing that, one thing you are that stood out to me immediately is as someone who took film courses, you're terrific at storytelling, which we know is a key component to be uh, becoming a f great film director. Hey, thank you so much. As someone earlier told me, you'll be a great film director. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, I love directing. I love directing. Uh, I feel alive and excited and energetic when I'm directing uh, a documentary, a movie, a short film. I love it. Um, I love it. I love it. And I love being on camera. So I love those two things. And for sure, for sure, I love it. Uh, I, I never studied filmmaking on, a, on an academic level. But I, I, for years, I started maybe about eight years ago. I started really learning everything I could about filmmaking. I see, saw every YouTube video uh tutorial about films about film theory about how to film about why to film uh about why people make these decisions in filming and how to make these decisions in filming i've read many books about directing about acting about editing uh i i've been very i've been self-taught in in um, in filmmaking and by doing it and by making videos about making live videos live videos have taught me way more about filmmaking they even the books have with live videos i've learned the core aspects of filmmaking uh and by telling stories i've learned how to tell stories and i think by learning how to tell story spoken and extemporaneously meaning without notes or without a script it has taught me the very core strengths about great story because if you script everything, a, a lot of people, uh, I think the, the downfall of, not the downfall, but like a thing that limits YouTubers from becoming great storytellers. Because you could be a YouTuber. You can make a fun YouTube video or a good YouTube video. But will you make great cinema? Will you tell a great story? I think what limits some YouTubers, or a majority of them actually, is that they're too focused on the script and the structure and the, and the uh, retention. They're too focused on telling you a specific story and writing it beforehand and planning it and then making it and then getting tons of millions of views. 
Um, but you don't really learn how to tell a great story that way. You learn how to make an efficient story um, that will get you a good short-term return, which is millions of views, potentially, and tons of money, potentially, like thousands of dollars uh, in the short term. But you, this is the question I ask. Will people remember Mr. Beast 40, 50 years from now? Will you remember Mr. Beast video two years from now? I appreciate what Mr. Beast is doing for sure. And, oh, he's definitely, you know, successful. But I'm more concerned about that question. Will you remember a Mr. Beast video two years from now? And I'm picking on him because he's the biggest channel out there. Uh, so he's easy to pick on. But will you remember? It's a good question. A lot of people would say no, unfortunately. Because that video, his videos are like, junk food it's like a cheeto you, you you eat a cheeto you eat a few cheetos you're not going to remember the cheeto uh three four years from now you're not going to say oh my god remember eating those cheetos you might on the nostalgic level remember a the 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 general sensation of eating cheetos but you're not going to remember that specific time you ate that cheeto four years from now if you're European, then uh, replace that with whatever uh, junk food there is in your home country. But you're not going to remember that. What you, were, what you will remember is that amazing steak you had at that one cute little restaurant. That amazing Greek salad you had at that little taverna. That one amazing beer that you enjoyed with a friend in that tiny little pub. You will remember that because that was made with love, with tender care, the setting, the company, all culminated to a great experience that stayed with you. And in media, you have two choices. You can make the type of media that's easy to digest, easy to munch on, easy to binge on, and it'll get a lot of views, you'll make a lot of money in the, in the short term for sure. But as a viewer, if you have too much, you'll feel sick and kind of stuffed and sluggish. And a few years from now, you're not going to really remember. I barely remember the bingeable TV shows that I've seen in the past. There's very few. But uh, you will remember a type, uh, the, the type of media that is made with so much tender love and care that is crafted intentionally, that goes beyond the necessity to capture your entire attention in the short term because not every type of media has to be deeply entertaining where your eyes are glued to the screen for 30 whole minutes. Um, some of the best movies out there are the ones that you get a little bit bored halfway through. And by being a little bit bored, you, you, you relax into a movie and it captures your deep, deep attention. And I, this is why I told uh, Maria, my editor and my uh, videographer, I told her, don't be afraid of being bored. Reverse. If you're starting to get bored, stick with it. Stay there. Don't go. Don't try to go for the next novel thing. If you're filming, don't try to film the next shiny thing. 
or try to film the next interesting thing. If you're editing, don't try to edit the next scene. Stay there. Stay there in that zone of boredom. Because if you breathe into it, if you settle into it, that's where the real magic happens. That's where you really have an amazing story ahead of you. But a lot of people are afraid of that boredom. A lot of filmmakers and storytellers are afraid of that boredom. And definitely the majority of YouTubers are afraid of that boredom. Because that boredom is scary. But that's the magic. Stay there. Pythagorean says, I think you're drunk. No, I'm not drunk. <laughs> This is this is just me. <laughs> uh, Brown eyed girl says, um, "Did you see Poor Things?" No, I did not see Poor Things. Um, I can see how Yorgos Lanthimos is an interesting filmmaker. Um, he is not my style. I tried seeing The Lobster, and I really did not like it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I tried seeing it. I had to shut it off after a while. I found it too wacky, too weird. Um, poor things. The reason I don't don't feel so compelled to see it is because I I want to feel good watching a movie. So um, generally, I, I want to I want to see a movie that doesn't only make me have a fun time, but upli uplifts me personally. So, yeah, I, I I quite don't like movies that are too lewd, <laughs> personally. But I know it's all per personal preference, because I like, I like my action films, that there's a bunch of egregious uh, violence, <laughs> for sure. I like, I like my movie, like The Raid, so everyone has their thing. That they 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 like, but I don't like too many. I don't like movies that are lewd. That's this is never. So that's why I haven't watched uh, poor things, and I don't like Yorgos. I don't. I I'm not, Yorgos like the most. Is not. I don't prefer watching his movies, um, for that reason. But I can see. I can see why he's appreciated. Let me know why. Why do you enjoy poor things? Hey, Jair says, especially in live streams, people are uh, afraid of losing viewers during silent moments. Yes. Yes. You know, this is something I myself had to learn to stop. To not be too afraid of is the silence. Which usually I, I was for most of my career. Nathan says, like horror movies? Yeah, I don't watch any horror movies. Not anymore. I used to. I used to enjoy them as a little kid. I, um... Especially as a teenager, early 20-something. I wanted to direct horror films, but not anymore, no. I don't watch horror films. Someone recently asked me, Hey, what's your favorite movie? And um, I told them, oh yeah, my favorite movie, right? And, like, one of my favorite movies uh, is Paddington. Paddington 1 and 2. And the person just started laughing out loud. <laughs> like it was the most absurd answer to the question of what's your favorite film. Especially as someone who's in their mid-30s. Uh, saying that a movie about a furry bear who is adopted by a nice English family and goes on hijinks. Uh it can be considered great cinema. It is. Paddington is one of the greatest films ever made. And this applies to a few other great films that I think are highly underrated as great cinema. A lot of people, a lot of people, a lot of people, uh, when they say great cinema, they think 
the movie has to be broody, brooding, and 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 emotional, and dark, and and angry, and and there has to be suffering, and a lot of people they think that that's what makes great cinema. I think the best movies out there, truly great cinema, the cinema I think that should be remembered for generations to come, is cinema that makes you feel true joy on a deep, deep level. And I think this is why, for example, a lot of people hate what the Oscar Academy votes for and what wins best picture as opposed to what people prefer it to be the best uh, movie. So, until very recently, I think uh, the Oscars have lost their way a little bit in the past few years, but I think they were on the right track uh, for most of its history. Because when you truly look at the best picture winners, everyone says, oh, Fight Club should have won best picture. Uh, the Matrix should have won best picture. All these movies show one won best picture that were really like known as great cinema interstellar show one best picture dark knight show one best picture but if you look at this competition and the, the movie that won best picture a good portion of those movies and best picture i started watching them because i thought that they were going to be pretty shitty because i pref i as teenager as an early 20 something i preferred fight club i preferred the matrix I preferred Interstellar, The Dark Knight, over, say, a movie like The Green Book. And The Green Book is the one that I, I can tell you the most recent example. I watched it because um, I was curious. Why did so many people, why were so many people hating on The Green Book? Because it won Best Picture. And... Uh, and I thought to myself, oh, this is going to be a, a stupid melodrama. It's going to be sappy. It's going to be boring. Uh, Dark Knight should have won that year. Or whatever its competition was. It was a similar movie that year that should have won. I remember I saw the Oscars that year. I'm like, oh, that other movie should have won. And when I saw The Green Book, I, I was truly amazed. Uh, because that movie, it's nothing flashy. It's not no crazy cinematography, no special effects, no deep, complicated plot with drama. Um, nothing really special about it in, in, in a very superficial context in filmmaking. But that movie makes you feel really good by the end of it. It brings a true deep sense of joy and this feeling of love, this feeling of camaraderie, this feeling of connection and friendship by the end of it. And it's because the movie does a great job in showing that. And to me, that's a great movie. That's a better movie than the flashy ones. Because... I could feel a, a sense of glee for a scene of violence. But is that a truly good feeling? Is that truly a feeling of, of love, of understanding, of beauty, of joy? No. The, the feeling you get after watching a, a big budget, gratuitous action film, or very... Uh, thrill-inducing horror film or a psychological thriller or a whodunit or countless other movies is a sense of glee. It's a sense of kind of uh, this, this joy that's derived from experiencing the depravity of humanity, which I don't think it's a bad thing per se, but I think there's a lot more value in movies that make you feel truly positive emotions. And so I decided uh, in the past year, I was watching a lot of these other movies like Brooklyn, 
Brooklyn is another great movie. Brooklyn is a movie that is not flashy at all. Zero flashiness in that film. It's a, the film is well, well made because it makes you feel transported when you're watching it. The acting is incredible. The set design, the, the editing, it's all incredible, but it's not flashy. There's not going to be film students five years from now, ten years from now saying, oh, study Brooklyn because they did this and that. No, they won't be doing that. Uh, but Brooklyn, in my opinion, is one of the best films made in the past 20 years. One of the best films made, period. Because the film takes you on this journey of this woman, but at the end of it, you feel this true sense of love. And the movie ultimately is about love. Uh, but it makes you feel like it isn't, just due to the storytelling is so unique that you feel like you're going through a movie that is about hardship. By the end of it, spoiler alert, it's about love. And you feel love by the end of it. Incredible film. Incredible film. And uh, there's a few others like it. Uh, there's uh, The Book Thief, Paddington 1 and 2, When Harry Met Sally, uh, in my opinion, Dash and Lily, and Nick and Nora's Infinite Playlist. Um, there's a few rom-coms like uh, uh, 27 Dresses. Uh, the Boy in the Striped Pajamas. Yeah, there's, there's a few great, great movies out there that are so highly underrated because they're not flashy. But they make you feel so damn good. So good. It's a movie that will that will stick with you in, in a way way deeper than most other films out there. But most people ignore them because they don't seem so interesting. Uh, but they will they will overall triumph. It's it's those type of films that have this longevity to them that the flashy, gratuitously violent, lewd, horrific, thrilling movie won't. That's why people still to this day are watching It's a Wonderful Life. Or they're watching um, Gone with the Wind. Gone with the Wind has its controversies, but it's a film that is about... There's, there's, there's a sense of triumph when you see the film, especially when you really understand what the story is about um and there's a lot of great films of history that are still watched today because they are those movies that truly make you feel good uh Susie says do you think uh, titanic titanic is another great example yeah titanic yeah exactly uh purple says uh please watch <laughs> poor things okay <laughs> I don't like violence, true, says uh, approval. Uh, purple is Wendy. Oh, Wendy, I didn't, didn't know that you watched on, on Twitch. Uh, Brown Eye says, uh, you want the audience to walk away with positive feeling to get inspired to feel like there's goodness out there in the world. Yes. And at least for me, that is my top, top intention. I mean, I'm not opposed to flashy storytelling, flashy uh, cinematography, big special effects. I'm not opposed to any of that. But uh, I truly, truly love, I truly prefer in my own in my own career as a filmmaker to make movies that make you feel really, really good. Uh, and I realize that we don't need to, I don't need to as a filmmaker... Uh, depend on flashiness, which is something that many filmmakers think that they do need to, which is natural because they think it's the flashiness that will make a great film. But no, it's the heart. It's the heart that makes a great film. And uh, it's easier said, it's easier said than done to have great heart in a film, because in order to have great heart in a film, you have to have a great heart. I, as a filmmaker, have to have a great heart. Uh, have to have a true sense of love and understanding 
and awe and beauty and wonder and joy within me. And then I, as a director, have to instill that and or pick people who also share that uh, to work with me in making that film. So it, it is, uh, it's harder to do than, than one would think. That's why there's not that many films like it. Pythagoras says, you've been using a lot of terminology from the Law of Attraction and Abraham Hicks. <laughs> Things like that. Uh, are you a meditator? Uh, I'm not sure what vortex you're in, Pythagorean. I'm not sure uh, what beings you're channeling with. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah, I, I was a huge fan of Abraham Hicks and the Law of Attraction uh, for quite a while. Uh, am I a meditator? Yeah, I do meditate. Uh, you mentioned your other videos of manifesting. I say more jokingly uh, about manifestation. I, I do believe that there's validity in, in, um, in the Law of Attraction. Uh, but the reason I say more jokingly is because that's not my... That's not my my uh, intention is to manifest something. Um, in a way, I, I I rather let it to God, let it be to God, let it be to the universe, than try to force my own personal egocentric desires upon my own life and upon what I do in the world. I'd rather be a conduit to something more than myself than just focus on what I want, ultimately. I think that's why I want to make films that bring people joy, you know. Um, because if I make a flashy film or documentary series, if I make like a true crime documentary series right now, like right now I can, I can decide to go for like a, like to make a, really good thrilling true crime i think some people were uh, some people in my audience will really enjoy that from me um and that would be an easy way to get recognition <laughs> that would be the easiest way for me to get on netflix uh and that surely would be the easiest way for me to to potentially get awards to get a bigger budget uh for sure for sure making a, a true crime doc right now oh yeah however i don't want to do that <laughs> i don't feel it it's not true to my heart i know like on a logical level yes and i know i can do it on a logical level i could do a true crime documentary series right now and i think it could um lead me to some short-term positive, uh, short-term gains. But I don't think it will be fulfilling in the long term. And there's no hurry with life. We can die at any moment. The entire, I myself can die at any moment. I am, it's not within my control. Uh, the world can end at any moment. That is not within my control either. Um, but if we live life with hurry, then you will miss out on the beautiful things about life. I think you'll miss out on the beauty of slowness, of taking your time, of building something with a strong foundation and letting it grow, letting it... Enjoying the process. This really has been a great post-video release discussion. Re uh, very inspiring and leaves one with good vibes. Hey, that's good to hear. All right, let me see if I missed any questions. I'll stick around for the last nine minutes to round up to two hours. <laughs> this is longer than my documentary series right now. Nathan says, did you see Oppenheimer? I saw Oppenheimer three times. I love it. Great film. Uh... Oh, Green Book is good, says Marjorie. Hey, Marjorie, I'm so glad you think so. Dindin says, I can understand why you like Paddington. He is adventurous. 
Yes, I ha I share a lot of similarities with the personality of Paddington. I for sure do, actually. He started off, by the way, doing dance videos, I believe, says Brown Eyed Girls, Hugo Slantomos. Yeah, he has a very interesting origin story, similar to I, uh, what I, I did. May I ask you, is there a particular filmmaker that you would have as a mentor? I think I, was, I would have uh, James Cameron as a mentor. I really disliked Avatar 2, not due to its filmmaking. I really morally disagree with Avatar 2. Uh, it's it's rare that I find a movie that kind of wholesome to find so so like I came out of that movie really like pissed off at the moral implications of that film, but in general I really love James Cameron's work, and I think he does a great job, and I would love to learn from him because he's a man who can make something really big. And then uh, I mentioned uh, flashiness. You know, I would say there's a fine line between flashiness and making something truly magnificent, truly epic. Uh, I think James Cameron is not flashy. He makes truly magnificent movies that are big. You know, if you were to make a direct comparison with a filmmaker of a similar caliber of James Cameron that is flashy, is someone like Mac Michael Bay or Zack Snyder. In my opinion, those guys are great directors, but they're more flashy than they are truly making truly great cinema. So I think James Cameron is one of the few people. I would love to learn from Steven Spielberg, for sure. Uh, for a younger director... Or someone who's a bit younger than that. Um, who was it? There was someone who's on top of mind. Alfonso Cuaron. Alfonso Cuaron. Alfonso Cuaron. Uh, he's directed some of my favorite movies. Children of Men. Um, he directed... No, Birdman was Alejandro Iritaru. Alfonso Cuaron directed Birdman, right? Yeah, I think he directed Birdman. Uh, but Alfonso Cuaron, I really love his style. The man is able to make these like single take... Like these films that feel like a single take. The reason I love making this type of immersive filmmaking is due to Alfonso Cuaron. Children of Men is one of my top favorite films as well. And that movie is more dark and, and dramatic, but the, the movie is shot like a single take. It makes you feel so immersed. And also um, when it comes to Birdman as well, I love that type of filmmaking. I would love to learn uh, from Alfonso Cuaron. Boy in the Striped Pajamas was so sad. Yeah, it is a quite heart-wrenching movie, but it's one of those few movies about that moment in history, Holocaust, that... Of course, it's sad, but also uh, comes out with a good lesson, which is kind of this um, feeling empathy and and friendship with with someone who... Is it not is is in the same position as you, uh, ultimately? How about Christopher Nolan? I would not want to be mentored by Christopher Nolan. I would love to meet him. I would love to chat with him. I think I could. I think he would be a cool person to have dinner with. Uh, but I wouldn't want to be mentored by him. I, I um, I love his films for sure. Um, I love all of them basically. I just don't want to make films like he does. I think Christopher Nolan is very good at making films that are very in your head, but not so much in your heart. And I, I see the deep value. This is why I love Christopher Nolan, because, you know, there are movies that really 
bend your mind in a good way uh, and make you think and, and, and it thrill you and excite you also on an intellectual level. But I feel, I feel like his movies are so devoid of heart. I don't, I don't, I don't feel that there's joy, beauty, or love in any of his films. Uh, and he doesn't need to make films like that. So his films are already great. <laughs> so th there's no need to add more. Uh, but for me personally, I don't want to make films like Christopher Nolan. Uh, I this is why I, I, in terms of big budget films, I prefer. A Steven Spielberg versus a Christopher Nolan. So to me, Steven Spielberg does movies as big as Christopher Nolan, but his movies have heart. And James Cameron, to some extent, as well. Less than Spielberg. But Spielberg is the best example, I think, of a big-budget filmmaker that has true heart in his films. Hey, Patrick says, I see Ariel's name in the opening credits on future movies to come. That would be awesome. Directed by Ariel Vera. Yeah, I, I, would, I would love that. It would, it would be my deepest joy to, to provide that. Brown Eye Girl says, that's why uh, uh, I love his work. Oh, I'm glad. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's why a lot of people love his work, for sure. All right, I'll stick around for three more minutes to round up for three, two hours. Let's see. Susie says, that's why I haven't seen Brooklyn because there's not much Brooklyn in it. I, I recommend watching it nonetheless. Watch Brooklyn. It's, it's for sure a great movie. And it does, I think, capture an aspect of Brooklyn that should be a, uh, cap that is very important, I think. It showcases why Brooklyn is such a beautiful melting pot. And the movie, I think, does that better than almost all any other movie about Brooklyn. Yeah, I, I can't think of too many examples that really show why Brooklyn is such this beautiful melting pot. Uh, aside from me, do the right thing. Ooh, we got a lot of comments today. I'm so glad so many people tuned in. Tuned in. Thank you so much. We got some great questions from Brown Eyed Girl and Patrick and Pythagorean and Susie and many other people asking great questions. Thank you so much again for asking great questions. Have you taken any professional film courses? No, I've not taken any professional film courses. I've only seen videos. I think the most impactful film course online that I've seen from a filmmaker Herzog I think I'll end with this story this surely has been terrific Ariel you're fascinating you're fascinating to shoot the film breeze with hey I'm so glad you asked some great questions today thank you so much uh what movies do you like the most I'll turn in different places. Uh, go back five minutes and you'll get a sense. But Paddington 2, Brooklyn, When Harry Met Sally, Nick and Nora's Infinite Playlist, The Mummy, uh, some of my favorite films, and Children of Men. All right. So I did uh, I did take a, a like an online course uh, from Masterclass of Werner Herzog. And Werner Herzog... He's a German filmmaker. Yeah, he's been in the business since the 1970s. Uh, he's made some great films. I don't really like his films too much. <laughs> I don't like his documentaries <laughs> too much, uh, personally. But I can see why he's a great documentarian, and I can see why he's a great filmmaker. But throughout the course of this like eight-hour film video film course 
uh, he said basically the thing he kept repeating over and over again. He says, don't listen to me. Don't listen to anyone. Don't give a F about what anyone says. You make your film how you want to make it. If you believe in it, people will believe in it too. And I'm making it sound rather pleasant. Uh, I make it sound like rather nice. He made it sound like, fuck off, make your movie. Make the movie you want to make. He's way more blunt. And I love that. I loved hearing that from him. Uh, Because, you know, I saw this made four years ago. It was a gift uh, from a family member who gave me this class. And I... I was at, at, uh, about five years ago, I was at a time where I thought to myself, oh, uh, I'm not getting that much success. I need to do things like what people tell, how people tell you it should be done. I should uh, start posting with a schedule and start making videos that have this structure to them. I should uh, start filming proper shots, the right, the the normal angles that everyone shoots with. And I thought to myself, I was thinking, I was already feeling like I got to rethink how I make my films, my videos, my social media content. And, you know, I just gotta, I just gotta say like, I don't know what I'm doing. I just gotta admit that and do it how other people recommend and here's Werner Herzog, so one of the greatest filmmakers to have ever lived. The man certainly has had an amazing career. And he makes films that are unlike anything else. His films are truly his. And here he's saying, um, fuck it. <laughs> do the movies you want to do. Forget what anything anyone says. Do the videos you want. Do the movies you want to make. Film it the way you want to make them. Ultimately, he did share some core advice, uh, some important advice with uh, how to go about certain filmmaking. But that was the gist of his of his lesson: do whatever the f you want to do. And that felt so liberating because I'm like, yeah, he is right. I will do it the way I want to do it. Uh, I will follow my own path. I will shoot it the way I want to shoot it. Uh, I am not going to try to limit myself because I think it could be, it's better done because someone else said it would be better done this way. I'm going to do it myself. I'm going to do it my way. Um, And I think the second piece of advice he said, okay, Now that you're doing whatever the F you want to do, do it the best way. Do it the best way you can. Don't half-ass it. Don't be lazy. Don't sacrifice your vision because someone contested it. Of course, you have to work with people. But if someone says, no, you're wrong, and you're the one who's directing... You can say, okay, I can see why you say you're wrong, uh, I'm wrong, but n- I'm not going to follow your advice. Um, you you have to do it the best way you can and not um, fray from that, not diverge from that. Do it the best way you can. So do whatever, whatever you want and do it the best way you can. And uh, that was great advice. And uh, I'm really deeply grateful from that. So, you know, I would be mentored by Werner Herzog. <laughs> Even though I completely disagree with his 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 very films. I, like, I don't like them too much. But I would do- totally be mentored by him. I would love to be screamed by Werner Herzog uh, and told off by Werner Herzog. <laughs> that would be a pleasure. Uh, so, um, so that is a Q and a, thank you everyone so much for tuning in. I really appreciate it. There's some great questions. 
uh wow i'm blown away i did not think i would talk this deeply about filmmaking but you guys asked some excellent excellent questions so thank you so much the last final episode episode six will be coming out next thursday at 7 p.m for the athens urbanist the final episode out of six episodes do rewatch the previous episodes thank you everyone so much for tuning in and uh keep being awesome and always wait wait and always keep on exploring. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye.